Holy Spirit. The moment you receive Christ as your Savior and Lord, the Bible teaches the Holy Spirit comes in and transforms and changes your life. And that is called in the Bible, regeneration. The renewal of life. You receive new life. That can happen to you right now. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. How wonderful to be free. Therefore, tonight, the only free people in the world are Christians. The Christians that are in Russia tonight are free. The Christians that are in America tonight are free. The Christians in China tonight are free. The Christians in Australia tonight are free. And they are the only truly free people in the world because their souls have been set free from the penalty and the power of sin. And we have become more than conquerors through him that loved us. And then the Bible teaches, someday we shall be set free completely from the presence of sin. The Russians did a remarkable thing a few weeks ago. They sent a satellite out into space that got beyond the pull of Earth's gravity and is supposedly orbiting around the sun. Someday the Bible teaches we shall be taken as children of God away from the pull of sin. And we shall spend eternity with Him exploring a glorious universe that He has created for us to enjoy. And no longer will we be tempted by the devil. No longer will we have the temptations and the pull and the gravity of sin. We shall be completely free. And so as Mr. Graham continues his message here at the Music Bowl, we're sorry that we have to leave you with this telecast this evening. However, many of you listening right now would like to be free. You'd like to know this freedom of sin and the power of sin that Mr. Graham has been spoken about. Right now, you can give your heart and life to Christ. If you will, receive him right there in the privacy of your own home. Wherever you may be, you can say yes to him. Until next week then, this is Cliff Bells for Mr. Graham and every member of the team saying goodbye. For 60 years, my father, Billy Graham, preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And at 95, he has a message that he'd like to share with you right here from his home. And it's a message I believe that can change your life and change the direction of this nation. Young Billy Graham hailed another Billy Sunday. Reverend Billy Graham one of the most inspirational spiritual leaders of the 20th century. We need you, we love you. Thank you for coming, Billy Graham. Would you welcome his evangelist, author, educator, Dr. Billy Graham. Our recipient, the man who honors us by being here today. What is your purpose? Go into the whole world and proclaim this message. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Shall make you free. As I look back over my life, it's full of surprises. I never thought I would become friends with people in different countries all over the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I want us to look at the cross tonight. 
I see how God's hand guided me. When I began preaching many years ago, it was not with any thoughts that I'd be preaching to large audiences. Come to the cross! God has done this. Christ is alive! In modern America today, there is a vacuum of the soul. Our country is in great need of a spiritual awakening. Well, there have been times that I've wept as I've gone from city to city and I've seen how far people have wandered from God. Of all the things that I've seen and heard, there's only one message that can change people's lives and hearts. There is a way if you come by the way of the cross. The cross. The cross. I want to tell people about the meaning of the cross. Not the cross that hangs on a wall or around someone's neck. We receive our freedom purchased by the ransom in the cross. But the real cross of Christ. The cross expresses the great love of God for me. It's scarred and blood-stained. His was a rugged cross. His real purpose for coming was to die. I know that many will react to this message, but it is the truth. And with all my heart, I want to leave you with the truth. God says, I love you. I love you. I love you with an everlasting love. That he loves you, willing to forgive you of all your sins. On our churches, we have a cross. It's embossed on our Bibles. I thought the cross was a relic. It was a medallion on a necklace at Best. It's an ornament that we wear around our necks, Christians and non-Christians. The cross really didn't have any meaning to me except for something artistic that rock stars wore. But talk about the depth and the real meaning of the cross, and it becomes an offense. Why is that? The cross is offensive because it confronts people. Even so, it's a confrontation that all of us must face. I was really hurting and just didn't understand the source of all my pain and, 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 and problems. I spent my whole life just burdened for something. Hungering for something, thirsting after, chasing this thing that I couldn't put my finger on, ultimately. I was abused by older people, some in the family, some outside of the family. So as I got older, I always talked back, I always got into fights. My whole world was surrounded by guns and drugs and gangs. I remember in front of all my friends, just telling them to watch this, and as a lady, uh, was driving down the street. I jumped in the middle of the street and pointed the gun right at her just to see her panic and freak out. And it was just me seeking power. My mom always told me about God. I think I had an idea that God was big and good, but as time went on and I saw more and more tragic things happen around me. I think that was the beginning of me just questioning everything about life and about God. When I was 10 years old, my stepdad came to pick me up and he said that my cousin Kelly was dead. I remember being so mad and really just, just deciding that if God was big and good, why wouldn't he protect my cousin who was so tiny and so awesome, such a funny, brilliant little guy. Why wouldn't God protect him from a huge muscle guy like his stepdad who beat him to death? I look out across an audience when I stand up to preach. 
And I think of all the people with their different backgrounds and their various needs. And I know that they are objects of God's mighty love. To the point that he gave his son, his only son, to die upon a cross. And the cross was the most terrible form of execution by the Romans for criminals. And Jesus endured all that in our place because of our sins. We deserve the cross. We deserve hell. We deserve judgment and all that that means. I know that there are many people that dispute that. People don't want to hear that they're sinners. To many people, it's an offense. The cross is offensive because it directly confronts the evils which dominate so much of this world. You see, the Bible teaches that all of us are wrong. We've all gone astray. We've everyone turned to his own way. And when we turn to our own way, we go astray from God's way. And that includes the whole human race. And that's why the world is in such terrible danger right now. It's not dangerous so much because we have atomic bombs. It's dangerous because of the human hearts back of the bombs, filled with envy and hate and strife and greed and lust and all the other things that could pull the trigger. thinking that same year that my cousin died about the depth of the evil in the world. I never wanted to have kids. It was just a new person to suffer. That was the year I started to cry myself to sleep every night and stopped believing in God. I couldn't get away from my own depression. So I started studying other religions. There was a lot of nice ideas, but there wasn't any tangible healing. And I remember thinking, I'm tired of the pain in my heart. I'm tired of going to bed that way. I'm tired of feeling like a burden. I'm just tired of not knowing why I'm alive. And so I remember the night I laid in bed and I knew I was going to commit suicide the next day. I knew that I was not going to live past tomorrow. By 16, I was getting high on a daily basis and got involved with a woman after woman after woman. And, you know, when you mix drugs, you mix alcohol, you mix youth, it's cause for an explosion. My mother was really concerned about me. I remember she just grabbed a Bible and said, I don't know what to do, but you just need to read this Bible. You know, I remember taking the pages of the Bible and just ripping them out and throwing them on the ground and saying, I don't care about your God. I don't care about this. This isn't mean anything to me. One reason that the cross is a defense to people is because it demands, doesn't suggest, it demands a new lifestyle in all of us. Sin is a disease in the human heart. It affects the mind and the will and the emotions, every part of our being is affected by this disease. How can we break this bondage? How can we be set free? God helps us break those chains. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. Everything becomes new. He can make you a totally new person.
On the day that I planned to commit suicide, I came home from school and my grandma was there and she wasn't supposed to be there. And she looked at me and said, there's something wrong with you. You're gonna go to church. I was like, no way I'm going to church. And she screamed at the top of her lungs like we were fighting back and forth and I just didn't want to listen to her yell anymore. And so I decided, fine, I'll go. And then afterwards, I'll go ahead and follow through with my plan. So I went to the back of the church and slumped down in my chair and hated everybody in the room. And the pastor started speaking and I hated him more than anyone. And he says, there's a suicidal spirit in the room. And of course, all the hair stood up on the back of my neck and I was, well, this is really weird. <laughs> and I got up and went to the door. A white-headed man is standing there and he stopped me. And it was like, the Lord wants me to speak to you. He wants you to know that even though you've never known an earthly father, that God will be a better father to you than any earthly father could ever be. God knows the pain in your heart. He's seen you cry yourself to sleep at night. The idea was so overwhelming to me. He's like, do you want me to pray for you so that Jesus can take the pain out of your heart? He put his hand on my shoulder and started to pray. It was as if the God of the universe showed up right in front of me. And the first thing I noticed was that God was holy and good. And the second thing I noticed was that I was so not holy and not good. I was in a really dark place. I was really lonely, really depressed. And a friend of mine reached out and invited me to a conference. And I'm thinking, why not? My mind was blown when I got there. I had never seen anything like it. I saw guys with, with bullet wounds and ex-gang members who loved Jesus. And I had never seen anything like that before. And so uh, I was intrigued. I'll never forget the pastor. You know, he started talking about Jesus. And in talking about him in an intense way that I had never thought about before, I had never just imagined Jesus as a real person going through real things. I just kind of thought of him as this fairy, off, distant person. But he brought it home to me and he started talking about Jesus um, being beaten and being whipped for a crime he didn't commit. And the skin being ripped off his back and him having to in the midst of his pain carry this cross up this mountain of a skull and being pinned to this cross. It was so vivid and visual to me. I could, I, it was like I could see this happening to Jesus. And I remember him saying like, how dare you tough guys call my Jesus a punk? You know, like, look at what he went through. And then the preacher said, do you not know you've been bought with the price? And it just came to a head. It was like, wow. On that cross, God was laying on Jesus our sins. They not only put nails in his hands, but before that, they scourged him. A Roman scourge was a terrible thing. They took whips and pellets on those whips and beat a person almost to death. And then they took that cross and made him carry the cross, which was in his weakened condition was almost impossible. But he carried that cross to a place outside of Jerusalem. And then they put nails in his hands. But that was not the real suffering. The real suffering is when he said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In that terrible moment, 
he and God the Father were separated. He shed his blood, and the shedding of that blood carries with it God's very life. The blood is the meeting place between God and man. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. And that's what Christ was doing on the cross. He was making atonement for our sins, and he was shedding his blood. Now, when you take the blood out, that means you're giving your life. And that's what it means. It means the life of Christ. The cross and the resurrection of Christ offers forgiveness of sin, offers a whole new life, and offers you eternal life if you come to the cross by repentance and faith. Jesus lived. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. I greet you in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Okay. Praise God. Well, I must say I enjoy this wonderful time here in, uh, at uh, the conference. Um, you are here. Jesus is here. I'm also here. <laughs> Glory to God. Glory to God. May the Lord help us to gear up for the greatest harvest of souls this world has ever seen. This world has ever, 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 ever seen. Um, I would like to share with you this morning from my heart. And uh, I believe the Holy Spirit will touch our spirits. You know? When I arrived in Africa, as I already said, I started below zero. And I'm sure anyone can start there. Some always want to start on the top, but in God's wisdom, trees grow from the bottom to the top. And that's where we all start, and we should never despise small beginnings. It is a matter of, of the Holy Spirit rearing us, bringing us up. There will be trials, there will be quarrels, there will be all sorts of unpleasant matters. But if you keep the divine call in front of your eyes and pursue it with all purpose you will see the hand of God will lift you up hallelujah um, I had some fantastic what shall I say some, some very fantastic experiences right from my youth that kind of uh, uh, shoehorned me into this position. When I, <clears throat> I attended by the Bible College in Britain, um, after I had finished my studies, let me start off like this here, this morning. Um, I think it is a very good introduction. I returned to Germany. I lived in uh, North Germany where my parents uh, were and uh, just north of Hamburg I always say it's quite funny you know I grew up in Hamburg and later on I lived in Frankfurt but I'm neither a Hamburger nor a Frankfurter <laughs> okay so when I returned I just completed my studies and I returned to Germany. In those days, we didn't go by plane. We went by train. And I had a whole day to, to, of, of time to kill in London. And I wanted to do some sightseeing. My train left at around midnight. And uh, I had the whole day at my disposal. So I wanted to do some sightseeing. But because 
I had just a couple of coins in my pocket. I couldn't, I, I couldn't go with an organized tour. I just uh, went from bus to bus, what they call bus hopping. One bus went in that direction. I didn't even know where it was going to. I just went along and then I changed at the bus station, took another bus and another bus and another bus. And I was kind of crisscrossing London the whole time. And then all of a sudden I, I thought by myself, I need to stretch my legs. I need to move a little bit. I got off the bus and just walked into a residential area for the sake of exercise. All of a sudden, to my surprise, as I passed the house, I saw a nameplate reading George Jeffries. And I thought, wow, I know of a man called George Jeffries. He was, he was a man who brought the gospel of signs and wonders to the United Kingdom. I read his book. Can it be that this man lives here? I thought by myself, no. I was just nine. I was just 21 years of age at that time. So my mind said, no, this is London. Jeffries is a common name. There must be thousands. And George is a very common name. There must be tens of thousands. So this is just a coincidence. But then a still small voice told me inside and said, You've got so much time to kill, why don't you find out? So I walked through the front garden, I pushed the button of the bell, and a lady appeared. I said, excuse me ma'am, is this the George Jeffries living in this house, whom God used so mightily to bring the gospel of signs and wonders to Britain? And she said to me, yes. I thought, what? I said, may I please see him? She said, no. <laughs> and I tell you, that lady filled the door frame. <laughs> she was like a roadblock. And when she repeated her no, I heard a deep voice from the inside saying, let him come in. I don't know how I passed her, but I did. And in I was and I saw George Jeffries walking down the stairs. I was awed. I didn't even know that that man was still alive. I said, I'm Reinhard Bonnke. I just finished Bible college. I've got a call to preach the gospel in Africa. And I, I, just, I just stumbled over your house. And while I was talking, trying to explain the situation, George Jeffries fell on his knees, pulling me down on the carpet. And he started to pray and bless me. And bless me, and bless me, and bless me, and bless me. And the glory of the Lord filled that place. After 30 minutes about, I got up again. I was dazed. I staggered out of the house, trying to find the bus stop. And I said to myself, how is it possible that I stumbled on this house? How is it possible? I didn't even know that man was still alive. He wasn't on my mind at all. How is it possible? Today I know that my bus driver must have been the Holy Spirit. I caught the train in the night back home. In Hamburg, my, my dad picked me up at the station. After greeting, he said to me, Reinhardt, I just heard the news that George Jeffries has died. I said, what? This can't
can't be. I saw him yesterday. But it was the truth. And then I realized, I think I caught a mantle. I think I caught a mantle. And that's how God does it. I need to explain here something. I don't think I got his anointing. Because I don't want my fullness from the fullness of any man. Out of his fullness, we have all received. Only if we get our fullness from his fullness, is would our fullness be the original fullness. And not some copied stuff. No. I didn't get my anointing from him. Because I was already baptized into the Holy Spirit. But I'll tell you what I believe happened. I believe a connection took place there. I believe we are all connected, interconnected. God's anointed are interconnected from generation to generation to generation to generation. And God connected me there with the former generation of evangelists for this generation. And I feel in my heart, this is why I tell you the story here, I believe with all of my heart that connectors are going to be connected right here today. These things do happen. And it goes back, right back to the Apostle Paul. It goes right back to Jesus himself. May the Lord grant this. That we are not just hearers and enjoyers of the word of God. But that we get going. Go! What frustrates me, I, I want to be very honest with you. I'm not really going to conferences much. I'm not a revivalist. I'm not called to shake up sleeping Christians once a year. That I don't want, I don't like it. Next year they are sleeping again. And next year they are sleeping again. Oh, I tell you, may a fire start burning in your souls. And that will lift you out of your seats. Let me tell you even something worse than this. Jesus will lift you from the deepest pit, but he will not lift you out of your easy chair. He will not. He will not put the propeller behind you and shoot you off. You've got to do this, this something, this something. Here am I, Lord. Send me. He lifts you out of the pit, but you've got to get up from your easy chair. That's the principle of going. Go, go. In Jesus' name, say amen. amen. Oh, hallelujah. When I arrived in Lesotho, I told you already, people who weren't interested in my preaching. I had to unlearn what I had learned before. And the Holy Spirit began to teach me completely fresh and new. It was the hard way, but it was a blessed way. All of a sudden, I realized the way I was coined and I had been taught was the way God could use me. So by his grace, he reeled it all back and pushed record and started afresh. Hallelujah! I started the Bible correspondence course in Lesotho. And to my surprise, 50,000 enrolled. 
Ha! Oh, when, when that happened, it was as if I had just emerged with the submarine. And through the periscope, I could see what happened on the surface of the ocean. And I saw it was filled with drowning people desperately wanting to get saved. I kind of woke up. Humanity is salvation willing. They are desperate. They want to get saved. And here I sit with my little wrong ideas. I said, oh Lord, help me to move to the drumbeat of the Holy Spirit. And he began to do that. I have now this big job on hand with those 50,000 students. I designed the course myself, of course, with only one thing in object, one object in mind. I wanted, to, I wanted them to get saved. Because they were not saved. So it worked very well. I had to rent offices. One day I had to pay the rent. It was only $50 per month but fifty dollars is a lot if you haven't got one in your pocket and the whole day I felt the pressure at, at five o'clock p.m. I had to pay the rent oh Lord well fifty dollars was a lot because there was nobody I knew that could give me fifty dollars anyway in that area but God answers prayer five o'clock came but the money hadn't come and I left the office just to walk to the house where we as a family lived my wife and our three children and as I was walking on the road home on the public road lots of people crossing all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Holy Spirit just whoo, came on me. And I heard a little voice say in my heart, Do you want me to give you one million dollars? What a temptation. A million dollars. For moments it shot through my mind what I couldn't do for Jesus with one million dollars. One million dollars, I said to myself, I could bombard the whole world with the gospel. Today I know better. All of a sudden a second thought crossed my mind. And I'm not a weepy person at all, I'm a tough German. I stood there on that public road, tears gushing out of my eyes, people passing me left and right. I had forgotten this world. I threw up my arms and I cried, No, Lord, I'm not asking for one million dollars. I'm asking for one million souls. I said, Lord, one million souls less in hell and one million souls more in heaven. That shall be the purpose of my life and ministry. One million souls. And a moment the Holy Spirit spoke words to me I had never heard or read before and these words have become the motto of my life. He said, you will plunder hell and populate heaven for Calvary's sake. <laughs> hallelujah! Oh hallelujah! Blessed be the name of Jesus. I just grabbed it. 
I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I left Lesotho. I said, where do I start? I moved from Lesotho to South Africa, Johannesburg, right next to the big airport in Johannesburg. Five car minutes away from the home I had there now. I remember when all the when all our little belongings in the boxes were dropped at the roadside there and I sat on one I felt like a speck of dust floating in the universe I said Lord I heard you say Africa shall be saved I don't know how I haven't got the clue but here I am I'm all by myself I've got nobody I have no team I've got nothing here I sit on this box at the roadside for four weeks I didn't hear the voice of God and I felt ill I went to a doctor he said to me you've got stomach ulcers I said what and then God spoke to me in the morning I woke up without stomach ulcers and I haven't had them since And I went to the little town of uh, capital of Gaborone of, of Botswana called Gaborones. I went there for another matter. A local pastor expected my coming and I arrived there. When I arrived there, I, I had to walk from the airport to town because I didn't have the money for the cab. And as I was walking, suddenly the Holy Spirit, he seems to find me on the road came upon me and he said can you see over there I said yes Lord it says there national stadium and the Lord said to me I want you to preach my word there Wow I said Lord I always had wanted to preach in a stadium but the people never came but if you say, I'm to preach in the stadium, I will preach in the stadium. I met the local pastor. After greeting, I said, I want you to go with me to the authorities. I want to rent the national stadium. Today, in four weeks, my crusade is starting. The first one. I saw his chin drop. He said to me, what? National Stadium? What do you want the National Stadium for? Don't you know that I've got 40 people in my church? I said, no, I don't know about your 40 people, but I know a few minutes ago, I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit. I tell you this on purpose, because I believe this is how God will deal with you as well. He was humble enough to go with me to the authorities and when I put my signature under the contract for the stadium, I started to perspire. I said, how am I going to fill that stadium? Somehow my mind played tricks on me. I already saw me in the national stadium with, sitting with 40 people. <laughs> know how our minds are? Conjuring up pictures. I, I, I quickly added a few days to my visit in Gaborones. I went from church to church. I said, I'm Reinhard Bonke. In four weeks' time, uh, we have a great crusade here in the National Stadium. Would you please be so kind to cooperate? Everyone said no. But everybody also said, who are you? I said, I'm Mr. Nobody, but God spoke to me. They said, anyone can say that. I said, I agree, but he really spoke to me. And when they all said no, when they all said no, I woke up. I said, Lord, you said I should rent the stadium. This is now our understanding, I said, Lord. I do the preaching and you bring the people. Peace came into my heart. 
I flew back the same day. Fasting and praying, putting together a tiny team. And then four weeks later, arriving in Gaborones. Oh, I had prayed so much. I said, Lord, just to comfort my worried heart, let the stadium be filled the first day. The meeting, first meeting came, there were 100 people. I know for sure because I counted 10 times. <laughs> I counted from left to right and then from right to left. But a hundred is a hundred if you count the heads and not the fingers. I took my Bible, I opened the Bible, I began to preach. I was very disappointed. I preached about 10 minutes and suddenly jumped up over there and shouted, I've just been healed! Another one, another one, four. And I thought by myself, that is funny. I didn't even preach on healing. How come they interrupt my sermon? <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Psst. <laughs> Praise God. I said, how is it possible? Today, of course, I have the perfect answer. Because I tell you for sure that Jesus often can't wait until we preachers have finished with our boring sermons. He itches to act. Say amen. He needs, he needs little persuasion. Our God is the God of action. And he delights to show his glory. He is a savior who wants to save. He died to save us. Oh, praise God. Then I called the people forward. I went down, I laid hands on them. Until then I had never seen such a thing. Everyone I touched collapsed. I was frightened. I had never seen this. I heard, I heard this happen somewhere in America. I had never seen it. As a matter of fact, I didn't know whether the people were just playing or what. I stooped down and I opened some eyelids. And I only saw the white of the eye. Then I knew this was real. But one woman fell down being blind and came up seeing. And one man went down as a cripple and came up leaping. I thought that place exploded. Oh. The next day, within two, three days, for the first time in my life, I preached to a packed stadium. That's how it all began. That's how it began. An absolutely packed stadium. For the first time in my life, I saw thousands of people getting up all at the same time. Before I made an altar call, first I didn't know which direction they were going to go. But they came running forward and they were kneeling there weeping. And the Holy Spirit, conviction of sin. Then I knew something, something has happened. I was longing for so much. Then the Lord spoke to me. I tell you this because this is the pattern, the foundation God laid for my present day ministry. And the Lord said to me, tomorrow I want you to pray for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I said, Lord, not in a public stadium. No, I came from the German church. We prayed maybe once or twice for the baptism in the Holy Spirit per year, more or less, mostly less. <laughs> and when the Holy Day came, we locked all the windows, we drew all the
the drapes. We locked all the doors. Nobody was to hear how we would praise the Lord in new tongues. I said, Lord, you want me to preach on the baptism in the Holy Spirit in a public stadium? The Lord said, yes, I have a very good reason. I said, Lord, what is it? Please tell me. He said, in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. And there's so much flesh around, I can't fit them into a prayer meeting. Oh, I said, Lord, forgive me. I stood up, I said to the people, tomorrow you're going to see what human eyes have never seen before. I didn't tell them that I hadn't seen it myself either. <laughs> I said, the Holy Spirit is going to fall in the middle of the stadium and you will all be filled with power from on high. Oh! The next day, capacity crowd. I was just about to start when a friend came to me and said, Reinhardt, can't you please change the subject? I said, why? He said, the bishop has come. I said, no change of subjects. It's a high time. High time the bishop hears about it. And then I started to preach. I said, how many of you want this glorious gift? By mistake, it was forgotten to mention anything about new tongues. Clean forgotten. Can you believe it? Clean forgotten. And I wanted to get up and correct that mistake. The Lord said, leave it. There the people stood wanting to have that gift. Oh, I said to them, lift your hands and close your eyes. But I kept my eyes open. I wanted to see. And then, as the praise was swelling up, I saw it. Gigantic wave of transparent, beautiful water moved in from my left side, slowly racing through that stadium. And as I saw the, that wave sweep over the crowd, everyone it touched, all the people in the stadium fell on their backs and were praising the Lord in new tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. I was shocked. I stood there shaking like a little boy, weeping, weeping. I cried, my God, my God, my God, is it possible? Is it possible? And since that day it rings in my spirit. In the last day, says God, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Australia will be filled. Filled. You shall be filled. New Zealand will be filled. Will be filled. Southeast Asia will be filled. China will be filled. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I said, now I know what breaks the devil's back in Africa. It's nothing but a massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We can come with our clever sermons, but you know sermonettes are for Christianettes. Well, if you come in the power of the Holy Spirit, no devil can resist. We are not on the defense. We are on the offense. It's the offense of the cross, but we are condemned to victory. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of Jesus. I know somehow in my heart, I know in my heart, that Jesus is here and that connectors will be connected. Maybe you don't quite know yet what that means. But it shall become clear, absolutely 
clear. I always was highly interested to know how did Jesus did the calling? How, how does he call? It is actually quite easy because he does call today as he did call in the past. And if you want to see how he did call in the past, you only need to go back to Luke chapter 6. Verse 12 says, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself, and from them he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, Andrew his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. Now let me draw your attention to one or two important matters. Jesus was on his way to pray early in the morning. It says here, so, sorry, he went there late at night. He prayed all night. All night, scholars say, means 12 hours. Let's say 7 o'clock in the evening to 7 o'clock in the morning. 12 hours. After all, he wanted to choose 12 apostles. He, I'm sure, possibly wanted to dedicate one hour of prayer for each of them. Can you imagine Jesus praying? I always wondered, how did Jesus pray? Wouldn't you be thrilled if you knew Jesus had prayed a whole hour for you? Huh? And I thought by myself, how did Jesus pray? How did he pray? Did it take so long for the Father to give him the names of those people? And then, early in the morning, he came down from the mountain. And now listen. When, if I read the record right, when Jesus chose his apostles at random, or I get the feeling he chose them as he bumped into them. You and you and you. <laughs> and what about you and you? And you and you and you and you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I need three more. Ha ha. One, two, three. Twelve. Please, excuse me. I don't want to be disrespectful to Jesus. In half a minute you will understand why I say what I now say. I thought by myself. I don't need to pray for 12 hours and then go and make such bad choices. Just have a look whom he chose. There was Peter, impetuous Peter. The very Peter who betrayed him. Oh my God! Jesus chose him. They were the sons of Zebedee. When they were in Samaria and the Samaritans refused accommodation, they said to the Lord, Lord, let fire fall from heaven, burn this village to ashes. What wonderful apostles they would make. <laughs> they had the spirit of Elijah. So I could go through the whole list and I could bring out all their faults. Let me just talk about one more. Judas Iscariot. Not 
just that Judas is carried, sold him to the Sanhedrin. But the Bible says Judas was a thief, a thief. And Jesus chose him. I want to warn every pastor here, never, never choose a thief as your church treasurer. <laughs> but Jesus did just that. He did just that. And then I said to myself, no, I cannot believe that Jesus prayed for 12 hours on that morning or through that night. Father, show me the Superman in Israel. I want to pick my apostles. I tell you why Jesus didn't pray like that. Because Israel had no Superman. Australia has no Superman. America has no Superman. Germany for sure has no Superman. There may be some in Hollywood, but they are all fakes. All of them. So what did Jesus pray? What did Jesus pray? You know what happened to me? I say this with awe. It was to me as if the Holy Spirit and carried me to that mountain where Jesus was praying and I kind of heard what he prayed Jesus did not pray Father show me the Superman he prayed something entirely different this is what he prayed he said, my father, he always said, my father. You know that I have to choose my 12 apostles. Help me not to plan success as the world plans success. Help me not to choose as kings and rulers choose father not my will but your will be done it took 12 hours for jesus to get the victory over that one point and then he came down from the mountain and he chose ordinary people because he knew the best among us wouldn't be able to build his eternal kingdom unless he would be equipped with power from on high. He had the freedom to take anyone, choose ordinary people, the most ordinary people, and turn the most ordinary into the most extraordinary. And in the kingdom of God, the extraordinary is no is so so plenteous that it becomes ordinary. Hallelujah. I tell you how we would have chosen. We wouldn't have gone to pray on a mountain. We would have gone to the University of Jerusalem. We would have said, give me a list of the top students here. The best communicators, the best orators, those who are movers of man. We have got a gospel that needs to cross the whole world. Jesus didn't come close to the University of Jerusalem. And this gives a chance to all of us. Are you happy? Are you happy? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He even chose me. He even chose me. That's a mystery to me. But I said, Lord, 
As long as you don't find anyone else, thank you very much. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's the greatest honor. It's the greatest honor in this world. It's the highest form of life on earth. I always feel that my mortal hands can build God's eternal kingdom. That my mortal lips can preach the eternal gospel is the privilege of all privileges. Oh, hallelujah! When we were fleeing uh, during World War II, my family was fleeing from East Germany to the West. And we arrived in Denmark. We Germans were all put into refugee camps. And from my fifth year to my ninth year, all I knew was barbed wire. There was no proper school. There were no qualified teachers. And when at age nine, we were repatriated to Germany after finding our father through the Red Cross. Ah. Was, they put me into the school of my age group. Oh, I had to catch up three years. That's why I struggled at school. Not because I was dumb. But I had that disadvantage. I struggled. I struggled and I struggled until I caught up. And it was very easy. But I felt, I felt so inferior. My scores were so poor. And I prayed and I struggled. In Germany, when somebody is no good, we have a special name for them. We call them zeros. If somebody fails his exams, if somebody can't keep a job, if somebody drops everything, we just call them, ah, ah, that one, he's just a zero, she's just a zero. Zero in German is null. We call them nullies. That is just a zero. Well, I tell you one thing, I was a zero when God called me at age 10. But I responded. I was so moved. I was shaking and crying. I responded and Jesus said, Reinhard, come, I want you to preach the gospel in Africa. You know what happened? I was a zero. And when I responded to the call of Jesus, I discovered that he was the number one. And when I, the zero, stood next to him, we together were already ten. Is there any other zero? Let me see your hand. All right, 100. All right, 1,000. All right, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million, 10 million, 100 million, 1 billion. I don't mind, as a matter of fact, I don't mind to be the last zero because the last one is the most valuable. Say amen. amen. This is the lesson. Jesus puts value into everyone who follows him. Eternal value into everyone who follows him. The other side of the story is, take the one away and the zeros become all zeros again. Oh. I have made up my mind. I seek the honor of God and not the honor of man. I'm not interested in applause. I'm not interested in titles. I'm not interested. If people give me great names, I don't even notice it. Years back, I was approached by a university. They said, we would like to give you an honorary doctorate. 
I said, I need to pray over it. When I finished praying, they called me and said, will you accept the honorary doctorate? I said to them, I don't need a doctor because I'm not sick. <laughs> no, I've got nothing against education. As a matter of fact, I got a little bit of it myself. But what I'm saying is this. All the wisdom of man will not save one soul. Jesus had to die on the cross. The Holy Spirit had to come. He raised Christ from the dead. And He sends us out and empowers us to preach the gospel. Let's seek the honor of God. Sometimes people ask me how I have survived so many years in this kind of ministry. I tell you how I have survived. Because I'm immune to the praise of man, I am also immune to the criticism of man. If you love the praise of man, the criticism of man will destroy you. But I'm on nobody's payroll. Here am I, as a servant of God. I want to plunder hell, and I want to populate heaven. Hell empty, heaven full. In Jesus' name, say amen. amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. I want to die one day with a microphone in my hand. And although I believe connectors are going to be connected here today by the Holy Spirit, don't you get the idea that I'm going to die tonight? You know how, what I, how I imagine it? I imagine standing with my microphone in, a, in front of a million people in Africa. And while I preach, suddenly I see uh, the sweet chariot. Oh. Coming lower and coming closer, closer, closer. And when it passes by my platform, I'm not going to drop my mic. I'm going to throw it. Who wants to catch it? Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In Jesus' name. I once prayed with an old man, I think he was over 90, and he was about to die. And suddenly a thought, a strange thought, touched my heart. I thought by myself, what would I pray for if I was now him, ready to go? Ah, I didn't need to think long. I said, I know what I would pray. I would pray. Lord, give me one more crusade. I want to hit the bull's eye one more time. Oh, hallelujah! I feel the finger of God is here this morning. And he's touching. You may be already a preacher with all his certificates and with everything he has and wants. That may be very, very well true. But God has got something more for you. He's looking for men who just throw themselves upon the Lord. Men and women! In Jesus' name! I cast myself upon the Lord for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, life or death, it all didn't matter. But I said, Lord, here am I. Send me. Let me tell you one more story. I think I've got time still for, to tell you one thing. Have I got time?
This is my petrol. I had a crusade in 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 the Congo, Lubumbashi. The stadium was packed. In those days, we still had the crusades in the stadium. Today, we have the fire conference in the stadium. In the afternoons, I don't allow anybody to interrupt me. I pray, I prepare, I focus for the evening. I was on my knees at my bedside. I just opened the Bible. I wanted to read where I had left off when the Holy Spirit said to me, Read where you normally don't read. I immediately knew what he meant. First Chronicles. <laughs> the first nine chapter I always skipped. Why? Because of the genealogies. Starting with Adam. Adam begat. And then the whole verses begat, 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 begat. I could never get any blessing out of begetting. <laughs> I thought, what blessing can I get out of this? But now the Holy Spirit said to me, I should read it. So I started to read. After one chapter, I stopped. I said, this reads like a telephone directory. I forced myself to read the next chapter. All these unpronounceable names. What blessing can I get out of them? Suddenly, whoo, the Holy Spirit was in my hotel room. And I could see the finger of God on my very Bible, on my very Bible. The finger of God was following those verses. You know, the finger of God is another name for the Holy Spirit. And I saw his finger move along the verses and every time a name appeared, the finger of God made a brief pause. So he actually, because there were so many names, he went in staccato. All of a sudden I realized these names seem to be a bother to me, but they are highly interested, interesting to the author of that book. Every name is extremely important to God your name and I thought by myself why is the finger of God moving in staccato and then I realized the Lord was looking for people who were willing to dedicate themselves to the building of his eternal kingdom. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? I was awed by the presence of God. What an experience. And you know what I feel right now? The finger of God is here. Not moving over pages, but moving through the rows, maybe starting right there on top. I may not have seen you even, but I tell you, you are on God's list to be touched this very moment by the finger of God. He's looking for people who are willing to throw themselves into his arms. 
who don't calculate always according to business principles. How much do I make? What about fame and greatness? I vow to God, I don't want to be a peacock evangelist. I want to be someone who really goes to the very abyss of hell, to the brink of the volcano, to rescue those who are about to fall in. In Jesus name. This is not a matter of career. This is a matter of service. Be faithful unto death. And I will give you a crown of life. This is the call here. Jesus is willing to call any zero. And the moment you respond, he sets himself in front of you. And you will change. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And the finger of God is here. If you say yes, well for you. If you say no, you may leave here. But one thing will never leave you. The fingerprint of the finger of God is forever impressed on your soul and on your spirit. You will never get rid of him, I promise you. one master and his name is Jesus 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 hallelujah oh praise God I pray that Sydney may not just get revival I pray that Sydney and Australia may become export centers of revival to the rest of the world I send who will go for us and he cried here are my Lord send me and if you're one of them jump to your feet right now just jump to your feet I wished I could lay my hand on you I can't because the, the arrangements here don't allow it but I'll tell you one thing the finger of God has already marked you and touched you and God means business with you if you are serious with him some of you have been already called ten times and you don't need to to, to stand up again you should rather go and buy a suitcase and a ticket and go and Jesus will go with you this is what I'm telling you as an evangelist who comes from the very front line some people are so obsessed with getting the approval of man you need the approval of God and that flame on your head is your legitimation and is your authority and your ordination in Jesus name rescue the perishing care for the dying Close your eyes, lift your hands, let's worship Jesus, dedicate yourself, come on. Lord, I pray that you may now lay your hand on every head in the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that all excuses of the past may and shall melt away and shall never be found ever again. In the name of Jesus. I pray, Lord, that connect us will now be connected with those who went before us. We will take their torch, their burning torch. We will take that burning button and carry it to the finish line. Australia shall be saved. China shall be saved. Indonesia shall be saved. Oh my God! Papua New Guinea shall be saved. Southeast Asia shall be saved. India, India, India shall be saved. 
And Lord, I pray, mark everyone that lifts their hands to you. Mark them. Mark them with that flame from above in the name of Jesus. And I pray that they may never ever forget what has happened today in Jesus' name. Come on, let's worship him. Worship him. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah! Oh, hallelujah! Hurra, papa, kashi, asari, anto, robo, poko, shia. Ila, la, masarra, poko, shika, la, la, basia. Ika, ropo, shi, anto, lo, 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 bo, siya, lasa. Isha, rabo, si, oro, lo, bo, shia. When you go through fire, saith the Lord, it shall not burn you. When you go through water, it shall not drown you. I am with you, says the Lord, and I will increase you, and I will strengthen you, and I will give a nation to you. Said the Lord, I will give a nation to you. I have already given a nation to you, said the Lord. Therefore, go, I am with you. And you, your spirit, your soul, and your body shall from this moment on become a riverbed for the life giving flood of my spirit says the lord amen lord we lift up holy hands for the salvation of australia australia shall be saved come on agree with me australia shall be saved new zealand shall be saved oh fiji shall be saved the solomon islands shall be saved Irian Jaya shall be saved. Papua New Guinea shall be saved. Indonesia shall be saved. Singapore, China shall be saved. Malaysia shall be saved. And India shall be saved. Lord, I thank you that your fire will race across this globe in Jesus' name. And we will follow the fire in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I'm looking forward to tonight. I really am I'm looking forward to tonight. I believe God is going to do something fantastic. Are you blessed? Yeah. Amen. You know, I got all my stuff here and forgot to mention it, that it's just like me. I just want to mention this, if I may. I've written a book called Even Greater. If you start reading it, I guarantee you will not drop it before you finish it. These are 12 real life stories that inspire you to do greater things for God. It's a fantastic, I, I wished I had time to share with you a little bit, but it's, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. It will knock you off your sofa. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Even greater. This is my, this is my, special wish for you and me god says i've got something even greater even greater for you say amen thank you brian god bless you. amen amen
Thank you so much. Thank you so very, very much. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. I just would like to mention one thing, if I may. My latest book is called Holy Spirit, Revelation and Revolution. You know, da Daniel said knowledge shall increase. And since Azusa Street, knowledge has increased greatly. Here on this subject, we are all witnesses to that. And you can get it right here in the bookshop. And then this book, even greater. I don't know if any one of you has got that already. Well, I tell you, if you read it, it knocks you off your sofa. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's fantastic. This, this is uh, uh, spiritual food. And these are testimonies, 12 real life stories that inspire you to do great things for God. Most people tell me they start reading it and cannot finish, uh, can, cannot stop until it is uh, uh, finished. So you will be blessed as well. Praise God. Praise God. Um, I need to tell you something. I feel, I feel prompted by the Holy Spirit to do so. I want to tell you how the, the Bonky family came to Jesus. It's just a half a minute. My ancestors come from East Germany, the thickly forested areas of East Germany. And a uh, hundred years ago, they didn't know Jesus. They had never heard that Jesus saves, never heard that Jesus heals. Absolutely not. But my grandfather, as a young man, was very sick. He had some form of rheumatism. They couldn't, there was no medicine. He had pains, ceiling pains, they call it, excruciating pains. Nobody could touch him. He could suffer no pressure on his body. And he often screamed. The people said they heard him right at the end of the road. And then a miracle happened. An Assemblies of God missionary from America lost his way in the forest. And instead of complaining and grumbling that he was lost and had wasted time, when he arrived in our village, the first question was, is here anybody sick? They said, yes, here in this house is a young man screaming. The village can hear him. That man entered the bunker home. He prayed for my grandfather who was instantly healed. My family became born again. That man was an old man. Four years later, he died. I never met him, of course. But one thing I know for sure, when that man entered my ancestor's house, the Holy Spirit put a thread through the needle. And I believe that man in heaven will get a reward for every soul I was able to win here on earth. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I feel in my heart the Holy Spirit is here to put the thread through your needle. Young men, young women, the next generation is crying out. They need to hear the gospel. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Amen. And that brings me right to my subject because the Great Commission, Mark 16, 15, Matthew 28, we'll find it, I'll find it everywhere. The, longer, the more I read the Bible, the more I find the Great Commission everywhere. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go into all the world. These were the last words of Jesus. And I'm sure that we have to attach great 
importance to his last words. The last words are very important words. Jesus did not die for us to get a great career or for pastors to have a well-paid job. Jesus died according to his own mouth to seek and to save those who are lost. That took him to the cross. That is the heart of the gospel. It's the cross and it's the blood of Jesus. It's his burial, resurrection and ascension. What a mighty God we serve. Go into all the world. Go. Why don't you go? I, I have a burden to preach this. And again and again and again. I pray that people may be stirred up by the Holy Spirit. The older I get, the greater the urge seems to be. I want to help young men to do what I also do. I'm happy to see these young people here in front when we were worshipping. I remember my own days when I was their age. How wonderful, how glorious, and how God had, Jesus had captured my heart and given me a hunger for the things of God it was unbelievable. And then, all of a sudden, you know, God began to use me. Jesus said, go, go, go. I always wondered why he kept saying. When I read it, I have the impression Jesus was just almost pushing them. He pushed them. Go, why don't you go? Why don't you go? Because God goes with goers. But he doesn't sit with sitters. And he doesn't sleep with sleepers. He goes with goers. He said, go. And then I, I had a revelation. Let me just quickly share that with you. From Genesis chapter 1. Why it is so important to go and preach the gospel. I suddenly saw, I suddenly saw the foundational relationship between the Holy Spirit and the Holy Word of God. The working relationship. What is the working relationship between the Holy Spirit and the Word of God? And that answered, when I saw what I saw, and I'm going to share that with you, it answered a thousand questions that I had in my mind. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light and there was light. Imagine this prehistoric ocean of matter boiling, roaring. Thank God we weren't created yet. Oh, must have been terrible. But it says the Holy Spirit was hovering, hovering, hovering over that chaos. He was hovering, hovering, hovering. The Bible doesn't say how long he hovered. Maybe a million years or a billion years. The Bible doesn't say so. But one thing I do know from this scripture, as long as he hovered, Nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened. Until verse 3. Then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Why did nothing happen before? The Holy Spirit cannot work on his own, he was waiting for something. He was waiting for the word. The Holy Spirit cannot work without the word. 
Somebody has got to speak the word of God. And then the Holy Spirit will just interrupt his hovering and there will be light. There will be salvation. There will be deliverance. Oh, hallelujah. And now I see Jesus push this disciple saying, go, 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 go into all the world. Why don't you go? The Holy Spirit is hovering somewhere, waiting for somebody to come and preach the gospel. It may be a nation. It may be a city. It may be a family. He's hovering, hovering. He needs people to rise and go and say, Thus says the Lord. Now that is the working relationship between the Holy Spirit and the word of God. We do the preaching. Of course, of course, you know, the Holy Spirit is not obliged to confirm what you preach if you preach politics. He's not obliged to cooperate when you just give your own opinion. The Bible is not a collection of Christian opinions. It is the eternal word of God. If we preach what the apostles preached, we will get what the apostles got. It's the original gospel. Speak the word of God as you find them in scripture. And I tell you, the Holy Spirit is very keen and eager to comply. Oh, hallelujah. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Some people, many Christians say, the world will get saved when we pray. I very much believe in prayer, believe me. I really do. Nothing works without prayer. This world was created so that it works with prayer. That's how God made things. And we do pray. But the world will not get saved if we only pray. Do you hear me? If all Christians in Canada would pray 365 days per year, day and night, for Canada to be saved. Canada will still go to hell until someone wakes up in the prayer meeting and goes outside on the street to tell a lost soul that Jesus saves. That's when the Holy Spirit kicks in. And that's when conviction comes and salvation follows. Hallelujah. Jesus didn't say, go and pray. He said, go and preach. We do pray in between. But when the day of harvest comes, some people said, oh, you're, you're, you're fasting all the time. Oh, no, no. No, we eat well. <laughs> especially when we are working we may fast before we may fast after but when the day of harvest comes that's when we eat and preach and eat and preach and eat and preach amen everything has its season and that is also included here Hallelujah. When Jesus died on the cross, something absolutely dramatic happened. In Matthew, we read that the veil of the temple was rent. That thick embroidered veil. And it, and it rent from top to bottom. Exposing the holiest of holy declaring that God was no more behind the veil. 
he was now out and about. The God of the temple had become the God of the whole wide world. For God so loved the world. Oh, hallelujah. I was speaking in the U.S. at a college where they specialize on worship. Now, I was there an evangelist and they the dean said, uh, we have an evangelist here. He, he, will, he, he will speak to us. Well, you can guess what I spoke on. I only got one theme. <laughs> Hallelujah. I feel this is so important, I can't get away from it. So I preached on how to win our generation for Jesus Christ. When I was gone, one student was my friend there, so I heard what happened afterwards. The dean said, my dear students, you just heard an evangelist. We just studied the tabernacle. We are in the holiest of holy. We worship. He is in the outer court. Well, when I heard that, I thought if I had anything to say in that college, Bible college, I would send the dean back to school. <laughs> Has he not re read that the, the veil in the temple was rent? We cannot hide behind a veil. Jesus is out and about. And I give you an even specific more a, a, a geographic description of where Jesus is right now. He's here. He's here. Christianity is not a religion for pilgrimages. We do not find Jesus in a shrine. Our Bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit. And when he says, go into all the world, we go into all the world and we preach the gospel to every creature. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus said that he would be wherever we are. In indis, his indiscriminate, his indiscriminate faithfulness. He's faithful. He's always here. He said, go. And I'll tell you why, yes, we have to go. If we don't go, Jesus will never arrive. Did you get that? If we don't go, Jesus cannot arrive. But when we go, he goes with us. May God help us. I said it before and I say it now. Jesus will lift you out of the deepest pit. But he will not lift you from a soft armchair. You've got to get up yourself. You've got to volunteer and say, here am I, Lord. It's me. It's me. It's just Reinhardt. But it's me, Lord. I want to go and I want to follow you. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The church is not a garment restaurant for fine food. It's a canteen for workers. Here you get high calorie, not to grow fat, but to go out and preach the gospel. Do something for Jesus. Is that true? Yeah. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, that is true. That is true. That is true. That is true. Creation cost God nothing. How did God create? The universe and everything. 
these galaxies. I think he did this as we do with little pepper balls. He enjoyed it. His mouth was filled with laughter. Creation cost him nothing. And did not, as much as God gives, it will never impoverish him. Because if, if you are almighty, what, 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 you can't become poorer. So when I give, it's different as when he gives. Creation did not cost him a single drop of sweat. But our salvation cost him everything. His only begotten son. Hallelujah. And now imagine God in the garden of Gethsemane sweating blood for us. What love and what glory. I pray here, young people, especially the young. I want to talk to the, to the representatives of the next generation. The Lord said in the last days, sons and daughters shall prophesy. Hallelujah! Young men shall see visions, not just television. I think the emphasis is on the young people here in Joel chapter 2. What a glorious opportunity. I heard that call when I was just 10 years of age. My father was the pastor. Jesus had spoken to my heart. I ran forward. I put my arms around my papa. I said, Papa, God has spoken to me. He said, Son, what did he say? That he said, when I'm grown up, I'm going to preach the gospel in Africa. My father said, Reinhardt, your oldest brother shall be my successor. <laughs> well, since my father had the smallest church in Germany, I've thanked God a million times for that. <laughs> no kidding. Why did my father pick my brother? Because he was the best at school in mathematics. And I was the worst. But God does his own choosing. And is not responsible to give us explanations why he picks the one and not the other. Why did he pick David above Eliab? Not even the prophet could, could imagine that. But God took me and gave such a hunger in my heart. Filled me with the Holy Spirit. A year after that, I could not be contained anymore. I wanted to go and preach. But I was only 12 and 13. I said to the young people in the church, let's have an open air meeting. He said, why don't you go alone? I said, good idea. I took my guitar, I stood at the street corner, I started to play and sing. I couldn't preach. But people stood around me and they said, oh, what a nice boy. <laughs> nice boy. I had a flame on my head. Nice boy. I couldn't preach, but I could talk about Jesus. And one man received Jesus. I ran home as fast as my feet took me. I shouted to my dad. I said, Dad, one man got saved. It works. Dad, it works. It works. When I saw a million people saved in one meeting, I shouted again, it works. It still works. Jesus is working. Hallelujah. Go. Preach. And that 
flame from heaven will travel with you. And you will see God's glorious, glorious, glorious cooperation. Now co-workers together with him. The first time God used me to, to heal the sick it was totally traumatic for me. Again in my father's little church. I was on my knees praying, my hands on the floor. Suddenly something happened. A sensation like electricity came into my hands. I thought, now what is this? Where's the plug? <laughs> electricity, electricity, electricity. And it become, became stronger. Suddenly I heard the Holy Spirit speak in my heart. He said, Reinhardt, that woman over there is very sick. I want you to go and lay your hands on that woman and she will be healed. I said, Lord, my father is the pastor. I said, Lord, he will never allow that. That's his job. I said, Lord, you don't know my father. He's going to hit me. He will kill me. How did the Lord respond? He increased the voltage. And the power came up. And came up. I tried to shake it out. It didn't work. And I thought if it reaches my heart, I'm dead. So I thought even my, either my father will kill me or the power. I can just as well obey. I've got nothing to lose. I'm not cracking jokes here. This is really what happened. So I decided to do it. First I checked father. His eyes were closed. He was praying. I checked the lady, her eyes were closed. That was the moment to go. On all fours, I crawled. Right next to that lady. I checked one more time. Father's eyes were closed. Her eyes were closed. And in a second, I popped up, put my hand on her head and popped down. She screamed. Ah! Then I heard my father's voice. I thought the day of judgment had come. He said to the lady, What did Reinhardt do to you? Oh, she said, When that boy laid his hands on me, a current of electricity went through my body. I'm here! Urabashika robo posari andalabasai. Hallelujah! I must say one thing. My father was proud of me. We became the best friends. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit is here. I'm now 67 years of age. I want to preach as long as I live. But one thing I want to tell you. It's time. I want to see the next generation pop up like popcorn. It always amazes me. When I hear young men, I say to them, what are you going to do? You are leaving high school. 
Oh, oh, I'm going to study there. Then I do this, and then I do that, and then I do that. I hear nothing about the will of God. I said to, I said to, just lately to someone, I said, don't you think it would be worth a while to kneel down and say, Lord, what did you have in mind for my life? I want to follow you. I want to do your will. And I tell you, if you do that, Jesus will hurry to speak. Because we don't serve a God. We Christians, our God, the Bible mocks gods that have mouths and don't speak. We have a speaking God. And we are hearing people. Just ask him to speak and he will speak. And I said, Lord, there before I left for Africa, I go to Africa even if I only win one soul for Jesus. And I'm getting buried in the hot sands of the Sahara. I said, Lord, it would still be worth a while. I still would want to go. My brothers, my unsafe brothers at that time, they said, Reinhard, will you suffer like our father? We didn't have food in the house. I said, I made an agreement with God through the book of Jeremiah where the Lord said, you will have water for sure and bread for sure. And I agreed that that is enough for me. Wow. I tell you one thing, that water was always the finest tea. And that bread had butter and sausage and jam on it. <laughs> Hallelujah! Make a contract with God, He overfulfills it always. It is good to trust the Lord. Trust him, trust him, trust him. He's talking to you right now. He's talking to you. Hallelujah. Huh. You may have heard me say that, I don't know, but some people, they listen to my tapes. I have a son-in-law. One day, he's a preacher too. One day he said to me, Dad, one day you will become slower and I will become faster. I said, son, sit down. I want to explain something to you. I said, I am like a Boeing 747. At the end of the runway, it is fastest. Amen. No skid marks. We just pull up and land in the new Jerusalem. Say amen. But until then, my heart shall go on singing. Until then, with joy, I carry on. Until the day my eyes shall see the city. Until the day God calls me home. Young people, the day for you has come. There is no higher calling in this whole world. You see, republics come and republics go. God bless them all. Fashions come, fashions go. But God's kingdom is from everlasting to everlasting and to everlasting. And with my mortal hands, I build his eternal kingdom. And with my mortal lips, I preach the eternal gospel. We have part in eternity. That's the only thing that will not crumble when everything burns. According to scripture. Make a decision. I want to dedicate my life to the service of God.
the Holy Spirit will come and touch you. You will have a flame on your head. That's a fantastic resource. Every time my brain does not provide an answer for my questions, I go one level higher. And I draw from the fire. And lo and behold, I have answers that surprise myself. Hallelujah. I come back to that. Let me just quickly leave the 99 and come to the one lost and prodigal son or daughter. The Holy Spirit is here. Scripture just comes to my mind from Isaiah, uh, from, from the Psalms, rather. Psalms, the Psalms. Let me see if I can find it quickly. Psalms 124. I'm sure it is, yes. Verse 7. Our soul is escaped as a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken. And we are escaped because our help comes in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Say amen. amen. Here, this speaks about the cage of sin. People are caught in a cage of sin. I was once preaching in Germany to a group of young men. Afterwards, one of them came, a student from the university. His eyes were cried red. He said to me, Preacher, what you preached sounds to me like a fairy story. It's just a fairy story. He said, Young man, do you always cry when you hear fairy stories? He said, no, I can't explain it. Something touched me inside and I don't know what. That moment, I had that picture, a picture in my mind. I think the psalm expresses its best. You know, a bird that is born in a cage and has never known anything but the cage will think when you talk about the golden sun and the blue sky and the high mountains when you talk about them they think it's a fairy story they don't know it but the truth is there is a better world outside and when we preach the gospel, this glorious gospel, and we speak of sins forgiven, we speak of addictions broken, we speak of peace with God, other than the peace, a, a chemical dream because of drugs. That's no peace. That's captivity. People may say, what? I can't, I, I, that sounds to me like fairy story. But inside, Holy Spirit has already touched your heart. And at the nail pierced hand of Jesus is here to open the cage. And you will escape. And you will be released into the world of the kingdom of God. And you will take flight and enjoy mountains and valleys. And you will sing to the glory of God. Hallelujah. But there is another kind of bird in the cage of the devil. That's the one who once was born in freedom. But was caught by the bird catcher. 
thrown into that same cage. I tell you, that's the story of a backslider. I say miserable backslider. I say miserable because I haven't seen yet a happy backslider. They sit in that captivity and they know what's outside the precious gift they have lost and they long to be out. Jesus is here to love you, to forgive you, to release you. That nail-pierced hand will come and unlock that cage and release you all. Our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. It's Jesus Christ, our Lord. You can be totally set free from all your secret sins. Some people from the outside look so holy. Inside they are so rotten. It's unfortunately true. In Germany we call such Christians submarine Christians. You see? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they are cruising at great depths. Saturday night, midnight, they begin to emerge. Look, 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 look. Right in the church. And some of them may sing in the choir. And when you hear them sing, for a moment you thought the angels from the New Jerusalem had arrived. So sweet, so powerful. And when they lead in prayer, you for a moment thought the Apostle Paul has risen from the dead. The whole Sunday, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Monday, Saturday, Sunday night, sharp midnight, the submarine reverses. And when you meet the submarine Christians, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, if you meet them on the street or at work, you never think that they are Christians. They swear like the world foul language like the world, filthy jokes like the world. Oh my God! I pray that every 50-50 Christian, every submarine Christian may emerge. Every submarine turn into an aircraft carrier for Jesus. Hallelujah! I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus was not ashamed to die for me naked on the cross. He suffered shame, the Bible says. He suffered nakedness. Artists don't want to paint him like that. But he suffered shame in public. And we can't get in public that word over our lips. Yes, I belong to Jesus. I belong to Jesus. Jesus is here, no matter what your captivity is. And he's opening that cage door. You will be released into the kingdom of God. The Holy Spirit will fire you up like a rocket. And maybe you will inherit my microphone. (laughs) 
Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. But the moment has come. I love you. I wish that I could just put my arm around your shoulder and say, come out of this submarine Christian existence. Come and stand up for Jesus. He will wash you from all your sins. He will break every addiction. He will set you free from all pornography. He will set you free from all drugs. Jesus is here. In Jesus' name. Let's close our eyes. Lord, I thank you that you are here and that you are aiming at people who desperately need you. I now pray that you may stretch out your hand and touch everyone in that cage of the devil. This day is their release day. And I thank you for it. You will do a perfect work. I thank you for it. If you feel you are in the cage of the devil, you need forgiveness, you need release. I so much would like to pray for you. I wish I could put my arm around your shoulders. It's as personal as that. Jesus is here. Even if you think people might wonder why you come because you are rated such a high holy Christian. But you know things are rotten inside. Come to Jesus now. All eyes are closed. This is not a show. But if you want to be released by the hand of Jesus, I would love to pray for you. Just lift your hand as a sign. I will pray for you right now. Let me just wave your hand that I can see it better. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. This day is your day of salvation. I want everybody to stand and I want you to come forward. Please come forward. I want to pray for you right here. Come forward. In Jesus name, come forward. Hallelujah. God bless you. God bless you. You are so welcome. There's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Just come and join these dear precious people here in front. Just come, please. Just come. Just come. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. You just come. Keep coming. Keep coming. Keep coming. Jesus name keep coming keep coming young men young women young girls and boys come Jesus is calling you nobody here is mocking you. Everybody is praying. We are so glad that you came. You keep coming while I speak to all of you that are here in front. What must we do to be saved? Just look at me for a moment. What must we do to be saved? The word of God says, He who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And when God says, shall be, and you do what He tells you to do, you will be saved. And no chain can resist the power of God. You will be set free. Jesus is here with his precious blood. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit is here. You'll get it all in one. We will now call upon the name of the Lord Jesus in prayer. And after that you will just go with the... Just through that door for a minute or two. the counselors will just have a personal word with you just a minute or two and then you will come back just close your eyes lift your hands I want everyone to lift their hands and I want everyone to repeat this prayer loud and clear after me in support of those who pray it here in front 
Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I am such a captive in the cage of sin. Lord Jesus, I repent and ask you to forgive me my sins. Let now your hand open my prison door as you have promised. Thank you that I can now be released I am free you have set me free wash me with your holy blood remove all uncleanness and put within me a new heart O oh God I now receive it by faith. I believe it and receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just keep your hands up. I want to bless you. Lord, I exercise the power that you have given me. I break every satanic curse. Every satanic curse is now broken, forever broken in the name of Jesus. And I thank you that you now release your blessing upon every man, every woman, every boy, and every girl. I bless you in the name of Jesus. I bless you, 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 I bless you. I bless you in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone who has received, shout Amen. 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 Could I now ask you to follow Pastor Duncan? Sorry. Just follow Pastor Duncan. Okay. Just come this way, everybody. Just for a Those minute, of you please, the front. don't go back to your seats. Come Just through with me into the cafeteria. Give them a hand as they go. Come this way, everybody. Come with me. Come this way, everybody. Over here. Just make your way over this way into our cafeteria. Come this way. Keep going. Keep going. Please make room. Let them through. Okay, let's just keep coming through. We'll just keep coming through. Come right on through. Just keep making your way through quickly, please, everybody. Keep making your way through quickly. So please be patient. I won't outstay my welcome. Just bear with me, please. When you invite, invite an evangelist, it's your own mistake. <laughs> Carry on, please, evangelist. Amen, 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 amen. I want to pray for the sick right now. I want to pray for the sick. I'll do it as we do it in Africa. That's all I can do right now. And after that, I still want to pray for those who have heard the call of God today. Okay? So don't go. Because the fire is still going to fall. How many of you desire the fire? 
Kurashila Masari and Dalabakato. Oh, hallelujah. Okay. I'm asking also the healing teams to come forward who will pray for the, the sick here. I pray a general prayer and the healing teams, or whatever you call them, will pray over them personally. The cell leaders, the cell leaders. Amen. Okay, let me start praying. You you may still come, don't worry. When I speak, I accept responsibility for my words. When you speak, you accept responsibility for your words. If you can't do that, you may need maybe some mental help. When God speaks, when God speaks, he accepts responsibility for his word and he says, I am the Lord, your healer. And I pray in his name and he will come and touch you wherever you are. And the cell leaders will lay hands on you right now. And many miracles will happen. Let's lift up holy hands. Lord, I thank you that you know every single person. And you know every single disease. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, you came to destroy the works of the devil. Every work of the devil shall now be destroyed. I rebuke every sickness. I rebuke every terminal disease. I rebuke every mysterious disease. Receive your healing now. Blind eyes open, deaf ears open, deaf mouth speak in the name of Jesus. Be healed from cancer, be healed from respiratory diseases, be healed from rheumatism and arthritis. You are now being healed from breast cancer in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that you are nail pierced hand is touching everyone everyone who's coming to you in faith receive your healing now in the mighty name of Jesus in the mighty name of Jesus those of you that are cell leaders if you could come to the front and just begin to mingle among the folks there's a whole bunch of people in the aisles so cell leaders any of you that are on our prime ministry team from any of the campuses just come right up to the front and begin the minister right away, please. While this is going on, I have a question. Who here this morning heard the call of God? You heard the call of God. Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Lift your hand. The fire of God is here. And that fire will fall on you. Lord, I thank you that you have called so many men and women, young and old. And I thank you, Lord, that you will send them. You will send them. You will send them with the fullness of your power and with the flame of your spirit. Receive now the fire of the Holy Spirit. Receive the anointing for evangelism. In the name of Jesus. There will be a divine impartation right now. Receive an impartation from heaven in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, worship the Lord and worship Him with in new tongues in Jesus' name.
God we serve. Jesus is here tonight. I am honored to be here. Thank you very much, Benning, for inviting me. I am so glad to see you, be with you, and we are all together with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, what God has done and what God is doing is absolutely, is absolutely glorious. And as I just said a few minutes ago, outside here to a little group, I said, the God that is omnipotent in Africa is not impotent in America. Yes. Praise God. He is the same. He is the same Jesus, the same God, the same Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Well, um, uh, as I said, I'm honored to be here in, uh, at, at a Jesus Culture Conference. I like the name, by the way, very much. It's a lifestyle, it's a culture, isn't it? And it's a family, and, and uh, this is all, all compounded. And uh, um, I'm also very happy for my dear friend Russell Evans, who is here from Australia, from the Planet Shakers, World Shakers, Planet Shakers, America Shakers. Amen. And... Uh, and my friend Bill Johnson, of course, whom I love and highly appreciate, although he's not here, but I just would like to mention him. And, and uh, a, a very big word of appreciation also to my friend Lou Engels, who, who spoke here. Wow, it's, it's, it's fantastic. You know, I think we have a similar voice. I think we, have, we, 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 we preached our voices to pieces but it is still audible though you know and then also daniel colenda is here he is the he is the uh, chief evangelist of christ for all nations you just saw him in this um, clip and he is my successor uh, i'm an old man by now i'm 73 years of age but uh i'll tell you I tell you, old age means absolutely nothing as long as the Holy Spirit empowers us. Yeah, what's the difference? And uh, I am moving on in years, but I tell you, I still want to kick the devil before I kick the bucket. America will be safe. 
America, we we'll be safe. This is what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. In Africa, in 1972, I heard the Holy Spirit shout in my dream, Africa shall be saved. And I saw a blood-washed Africa. And, and everybody thought, this is, it's impossible, it, it's impossible, it's impossible. But I heard it in four consecutive nights. Until I then said to my wife, after night number four, I think the Holy Spirit is trying to tell me something. <laughs> and then I saw him in action as we moved. You know, God expects us to move. And then he moves. That is the ABC of service for God. We move, then he moves with us. Hallelujah. And I heard him last year saying, America will be saved. America will be saved. People say, what, what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Well, you know, after having seen what I have seen in Africa, I have become an incurable believer. And I don't want to be cured. But I believe America will be saved. And we will march toward it, towards it. And the Lord will do what only He can do. I'm just a small little evangelist. But I tell you, God takes the small people doesn't take the big ones like like Goliath or like Saul I think he's got somehow in the Bible big people have have a bad press but he takes the nobodies and turns them into somebodies and the world's rejects are God's elects that's him that's this Bible amen so we are starting, we are starting. I, 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 I so much, I so much agree with, with uh, Benning and with, with Lou. Yes, we will go from, from stadium to stadium, from city to city, from state to state, and from coast to coast in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we'll do it together. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. I still wanted to tell you that I'm on Facebook. <laughs> Don't forget. Don't forget. How many of you follow me on Facebook? Wow. Well, that's a, that's a small minority here. But check me out. I've got 3.4 million followers. On my, on my four language uh, uh, Facebook and I be, they tell me by the end of the year I will have five million. Isn't that wonderful? I, it's, it's not, I'm not going to tell you when I drink coffee or tea. I, I, for me, Facebook is a pulpit. And, and, and you, will, you will get punchy stuff from the word of God and it will bless you greatly. Amen. Amen. Make sure. And already having given, having spilled the beans here, I, being, being an old man, I have the great joy that two of my granddaughters are here tonight. Where are you? Where are you? Can you just wave wherever you are? Oh, there you can see them. Yes, Annika and Alicia. God bless you. Praise God. Praise God. I have been praying a lot for tonight. And I believe the Lord has given me a word. And I want to preach. I've been, I've been on my knees and I've said, Lord, what do you want me to say? I want to speak to you. 
as if it was my last sermon. I don't intend to die tonight, don't worry. <laughs> but I want to speak with that same urgency and emergency. I'm an evangelist, I'm after souls. Every time I take a microphone, I have one desire in my heart. I want hell empty and heaven full. Yes! That's why we preach the gospel. And that is the reason why Jesus died. That is the reason. He died to seek and save the lost. He died to deliver those who were bound to set the captives free, to heal the sick, and do glorious miracles. He's the God of miracles. Everything in the Bible is miraculous. It's miraculous. Somebody said to me, Reinhard, you are preaching sensation. I said, well, it cannot be avoided, you know. It cannot be avoided because this book is a miracle book. From beginning to end, it's all miracle. It cannot be avoided. I don't believe in sensationalism, but I do believe in sensation. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. 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 I want to speak here tonight about faith and fire. Faith and fire. And I want to contrast it a little bit here and, um, and um, let me say, uh, I want to give it to you in form of, 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 of short little, uh, <clears throat> as if somebody would string up beautiful pearls. You know, that's what I want to present to you. Some, some necklace with beautiful pearls, stringing up those truths. And I pray that the Holy Spirit may, may, may plant them in your heart as he planted them into my heart. And, and if he is successful, you will be successful as well. Because these truths changed my own life got me going for God and, and seeing since 1987 when we started to keep records about decisions for Christ in our gospel crusades we have reached the figure of 75 million 75 million you know what that means 75 million less in hell and 75 million more in heaven. That's what it means. That's what it brings. That is the result. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want to, I want to start uh, uh, with, with Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. This will blow you away right from the start. Um, you, if you have a pen and you have a Bible, I want you to underline something. I'm reading Mark 16 from verse 11. That was before Jesus ascended to heaven and gave the great commission to the disciples. Now, verse 11. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Number one, verse 13, and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Verse 14, later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he repeated took their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Can you believe it? Three times in a row, it says here, they did not believe. 
They did not believe. They did not believe. Now that they did not believe, I can still believe. But what I find difficult to believe is the fact that Jesus, a few verses later, gave the great commission to these unbelieving believers. And he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Wow! If I had been there that day, I think I would have sneaked up from behind and pulled the garment of Jesus and would have said, whispered into his ear, Lord Jesus, are you sure you picked the right people? <laughs> Do you know that behind your back they are full of doubts? Do you know that they are questioning you all the time? Are you sure you picked the right people? You know what I think Jesus would have done? Jesus would have turned around. He would have done this. Shut up, bonky. I have a secret. You don't yet know. Hallelujah. 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 You know what amazes me is that a perfect God desires the cooperation of imperfect people. But he says, you shall receive power and now listen after verse 14 we read verse 20 it says there and they went out and preached everywhere and the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs